Okay, so we will just have some final words regarding the optimization of function of two variables, which is a continuation of where we left last time. So this is just a simple illustration of what it means for a set to be closed and bounded. Bounded, as you can see, you can find a circular finite radius contained in the set. In the case of what is closed, it means that you contain the boundary, and the boundary point is precisely a point for which if you extend the circle, you will find points inside the set and inside the set and outside the set. So that's just a picture for what I mentioned before. And now to finalize, in terms of a procedure to find the absolute extrema of the function of two variables, where the region must be closed, which is this illustration, and bounded, which is related to this, goes along these steps. So the procedure is the following one. The first step is to find the critical point of the function of two variables x and y in the region R. The second step is to find all points on the boundary of R or extreme values can occur. And so bear in mind that this is a 2D analog of the procedure for 1D in bounded domains where usually you have an interval and in order to find the maximum and minimum over the interval you need to find the critical points on the interval and then evaluate the function at the endpoints. I compare, I have to compare the value of the function at the critical point and then at the endpoints and to see which one is bigger. In this case, the 2D has a boundary which is not an endpoint, but actually something like that. That's why in addition of the critical points, which are inside the region, you have to look for the function at the boundary. And so, well, for simple geometries, we won't do a problem related to this, but if you see the examples in the textbook are triangles, the boundary is a triangle, so essentially you have three line segments, and it's making the function of two variables into one variable, and then just optimizing in that boundary. So it's, just keep in mind the 1D procedure and you will see that there are some analogies. The third step, is to evaluate the function at the point x not y not for each of the points of the form x not y not that we found in the steps one and two. So either the critical point or the one in the boundary, or the ones in the boundary. So The largest of these values is the absolute maximum of the function in the region and the smallest is the absolute minimum. And this would be the end of the procedure. But, I mean, there are basically two steps or two lines of thinking going on at this point. The first one is that you know when a function is continuous and a region which is closed and bounded, the minimum and the maximum should be obtained inside the region. That is the first theorem. The second one is that you're assuming that the function is smooth enough so that it's differentiable and it's well behaved. And therefore, in the interior, if it has a relative minimum or maximum, it should be a critical point. If it's not in the interior, it must be in the boundary, which is why you reduce, well, later on, trying to find the maximum value at the end of the boundary or the minimum at the boundary. It's um, the equivalent step in one. For that, usually, the geometry of the boundary will be simple enough that you know how to do that. If you reduce a function of two variables to one variable by fixing out the boundary, say, for example, a coordinate y equal to constant to x equal to constant, 
you can do the same minimization that you used to do in the one case. And then you just have to compare the values. So just keep in mind that it's an analog uh, way of thinking from the 1D, in which the extensions are due to the geometry, but it is a step by step. Interior, boundary, compare values, that's all. So we won't do an example because, well, first of all, we have a lack of time in the course, and second, um, perhaps we will see um, problems like this in further sections, perhaps in the next one, that we will jump into the next topic, which is related to section 7.5. And is related to constrained optimization. Which in particular is related to the method of Lagrange multipliers. So I have been talking with at least one of the instructors who taught the course one year ago. And in his viewpoint, this was one of the hardest topics for his previous group. So I would really recommend it that you pay attention in this topic, okay? Um, this actually is a procedure needed for your own applications in which, okay, if you know that the domain is infinite, you know that the relative maximum and minimum are at the critical point, but usually, in addition of having the domain bounded and closed, you might have a constraint. Let's say that you have a fixed budget and you cannot spend more than that. So. The domain would not only be made of a region, but also of a curve that might be defined by a constraint that might come from a real application. So the idea of the problem is that now that you know how to find the relative maximum and minimum, you should know how to do it when there is also a constraint imposed. That is pretty much the idea of this talk. So you have a function of two variables. that is to be optimized subject to a restriction, which we're gonna call the constraint on the variables. And perhaps a picture can illustrate the problem more than an equation in this case. So you have the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis. You have your surface. And, okay, the shape of the surface would be like this, right? So without any constraint, you would know that the local maximum is here. Okay? But, okay, so that's basically, you want the unconstrained maximum. However, let's say that I tell you, well, I actually do not want the maximum value either over the whole plane or over that circle, ellipsoid, whatever. I want it over the set of points that are constrained to satisfy the equation of a line, which would be this. So this would be geometrically my constraint. The points in the plane cannot be all over this circle or this ellipsoid, but they have to satisfy the constraint of being along this line. So basically, it's over the surface, but it also needs to satisfy the equation of the line. This we're gonna call the constraint curve. A line is a curve. It can be more complicated, but for the sake of the picture, it's just a line. And therefore, we have to minimize this surface along the points that satisfy the constraint, meaning that they are over this line, which means that basically, I would have to Consider now this curve. And for this curve, the constraint maximum is over here. So of course, if there are no restrictions, we know that the maximum is here. But if I have the restriction that the points x, y should be in this line, the actual constraint maximum would be around this point. That is very intuitively clear, right? The geometry is giving you what you have to do. This is what you have to satisfy. So the maximum is not here, it's here. So, I mean, if you want for clarification to see a picture, if it's not clear enough, 
basically I can show you just the textbook in one second and this would be cool. Um, well, it's pretty much the same curve that I'm doing, right? So you have the surface without any constraints, the maximum return. If you have the constraint, you see the line. We have to look for the points along that line in the surface so that they maximize this function and the maximum will be there if it satisfies the constraint. But the picture is the same. So, for the case of a line, it might be simple to reduce that problem basically intuitively from two variables to one variable. The problem is that you cannot do that every time, especially if the curve is very complicated. For the case of a line, it might be easy. I do not deny that. But maybe the constraint is way more complicated, and so you have to use a different technique. So. Instead of reducing this to a problem of a single variable, which might not be feasible, essentially if the equation that defines the relation between x and y for the constraint might be complicated. We can use the method of Lagrange multiplier. And so this method introduces a third variable, which we're going to call the multiplier, or the Lagrange multiplier if we want, to solve the constraint optimization problem. Okay. So at this point we're clear that the constraint optimization is slightly different because you do not only have to either maximize or minimize, but you also have to satisfy a constraint. And that is something that we have not done in the previous problem. So If you think about the problem, basically, we have a relative extremum, of the original function, but is subject to the constraint, and we're going to define it by a function g of x, y equal to k. I mean, this is basically the definition of a curve. If you think about it, x plus y equal to 1, where that would apply to that, where g is equal to x plus y and k is equal to 1. But this is just a general way of writing a curve in the plane. And so this is the constraint defined by this curve. And having that constraint, we want to maximize this. And it must occur, the relative extremum must occur at a critical point of a new function that we will define, which is capital F, which is the original F, little f, minus lambda, g minus k. Now, I have done a little bit of a change. Um, okay. If I tell you to optimize this, this is the previous problem, right? Now, this is taking charge of the constraint. For the constraint, g minus k should be zero, okay? I'm just defining a new function. At this point, it is not clear how it's gonna come up. But I have to optimize and also to satisfy this constraint. Now, if I basically optimize this function capital F, by the criteria of critical point, and then basically take lambda as a third variable, you can see that the constraint will also be satisfied. And that, that is what I'm going to show you right now. Okay? So what we're doing is actually defining a new variable, which is lambda. Lambda is a new variable, and it's called the Lagrange multiplier.
And now, if we want to optimize subject to the constraint, we have to find critical points of the other function. So to find critical points of capital F, well, I haven't written the dependence of F on lambda, but it's a function of lambda two of x and y and lambda. So this should be, if it's a critical point, the partials f lambda, f x, and f y should vanish. Think about it. I mean, if you want, I can even write this if you want. f of x, y, and lambda. Okay. So I have a function of three variables now. In this new function, I'm going to find the critical points, which means that the partials with respect of those three variables should vanish. That's why I have the usual partial with respect to x equal to zero, partial with respect to y equal to zero, the same way I did the critical points before, but then also in terms of the new variables. Now, you will see why we added this to capital F, because if I do the computation of the partial with respect to lambda, what I have is equal to minus g of x, y minus k. And so, if this condition happens, which means that the partial with respect to lambda is equal to zero, that means that g of x and y should be equal to k, which is that I'm satisfying the constraint. So it's a little bit like an artificial way of imposing the constraint, but by adding this variable lambda, what I'm doing is formally speaking that if I find a critical point of the new function, one of the conditions should be the constraint. So at least in that respect, I'm okay. Because I have to optimize, but I also have to satisfy the constraint. The condition f lambda equal to zero guarantees that I will satisfy the constraint. So that step is taken care of. And then I have to find the critical points fx and fy, capital, equal to zero, the same way that I did for the previous optimization. So I didn't, I'm doing the optimization, find the critical point, and also satisfying the constraint. Loosely speaking, that is the whole idea. Okay? So if I do the evaluation of this, where this is capital F, this would be so partial of this with respect to x, so partial, and then minus lambda gx, right? Then this would be equal, if fy is equal to zero, this will f with respect to y minus lambda gy, right? And that should be equal to zero, which means that fx is equal to lambda g of x, and that means that fy is equal to lambda gy. So I have this condition, this condition, and the constraint, okay? And now, I have three equations for three variables, which are in this case x, y, and lambda. So the change in notation f, x, y, lambda actually was not so bad. And what I have to think is that I'm going to solve these three equations for three variables. And then we will find the critical points A comma B, and then we evaluate the function at those points, okay? So at least I will get the constraint, two conditions related to the partial x and y. I have three equations for three variables, x, y, and lambda. From that, I will determine the critical points that satisfy them, particularly with respect to x and y. And then I do the evaluation to see where I have the maximum or the minimum. That's the whole idea. Um, again, we have this way of thinking that if there is an extremum, either a maximum or a minimum, um, it should be at a critical point. The converse, as we have mentioned before, does not necessarily happen. The fact that you have a critical point does not guarantee that you will have either a maximum or a minimum. You could have saddle points, etc., etc. But for the sake of problems that we will solve, usually they will be simple enough that actually we can see that we have a maximum or a minimum. That's pretty much the note. So, just as a mental note, okay, Lagrange multipliers imply that any constrained extrema must occur at critical points of capital F. Now, what I haven't said is provided that they exist. They might or they might not. So, 
what I haven't mentioned is basically this statement doesn't imply their existence. And well, then there is a clarification of the book that basically the problem will be simple enough that so that always this uh, maximum or minimum will happen. So that I won't write, it is in your book, and that is it. So think about this. It's probably the first time that you see this formulation. It's basically changing the problem in the sense that you have the original function plus a new term. This term is taking care of the constraint. When the constraint happens, this is equal to zero. So actually that wouldn't matter. But in general, you don't know for sure if you will satisfy the constraint. In any case, when you define this new function of three variables, x, y, and lambda, if you apply the criteria for critical points, assuming that there is a maximum or minimum, it must occur at a critical point, which means that f lambda should be zero, fx should be zero, and fy should be zero. f lambda equal to zero will give you the constraint, okay? The second one will give you basically the maximum or minimum or the critical points the same way you used to do for the previous problems where you did not have any constraint. And basically by solving these three equations for x, y, and lambda, you're done. That's the statement. The way that I would suggest to learn about this is by practicing problems because I'm pretty sure it's the first time that you see this and you might not be completely familiar. And it's an idea that takes time to digest. So please review it again at home, try to do some exercises, we'll do some examples here. So I know the concept is not easy, but please do not, do not disregard this difficulty because as far as I have been told, this is actually where most of the people from the previous course had a trouble. So keep it in mind, okay? Um, we will just state again the method as this methodology of uh, doing step-by-step -step things where if you have the method of Lagrange multiplier, the step one is to basically to the formulation. The goal is to find the largest or the smallest value of the function of two variables that is subject to a constraint which is the restriction expressed mathematically as the function g of x, y equal to k assuming that this extremum exists. So this is important. The second, of course, if you see in the previous calculations what we did, we need to compute the partial, which are f sub x, f sub y, d sub x, d sub y, and then to find the points a comma b and the values of lambda. Lambda, it's not actually your original variable. That's why, in a way, we don't care too much about it for the moment. But it's a function of three variables, so you have to minimize with respect to x, y, and lambda. And so these values should satisfy the system of equation. the form fx of a comma b equal to lambda g x evaluated at a b, fy evaluated at a b, lambda g y evaluated at a b, and then g of a comma b equal to k. So these three equations have a name, and they are Lagrange's equations. The last one is a constraint, of course. The other two are basically just formulating a little bit different what I found before, where fx minus lambda gx equal to zero. It's just passing to the other side, okay? But they have to satisfy this. Now, the third one is to evaluate the function at each point a comma b, which is a solution of the system above. And the fourth one is to basically do an interpretation that if you have a function of two variables, 
that has the largest or the smallest value subject to the constraint g of x, y equal to k, it will be the largest or the smallest of the values in the point group. Meaning that, okay, if I have actually a relative maximum or minimum, I should have found it by solving this pre-system of equations. That's where the minimum or maximum should be happening, if there is one. So, we just rewrote kind of what we did before, except for writing directly the system of equations that we have to solve. Now we will do some examples. Um, Usually the book is pretty direct, that pretty much it assumes that you have memorized these three, and it goes straight into calculating the effects of y and gx, gy, and just write them. So um, keep that in mind when you read the book. Um, in this case, we will perhaps stop a little bit in the first examples to show where that is coming from. But again, the methodology of the course is to learn by doing, so we have to do some examples. And the first one, which is 7.5.1, is basically related to one of these, um, well, basically what you saw in 1D uh, perhaps was a problem of the form for a given area, maximize the perimeter or minimize the perimeter, etc. cetera. Um, here you will have the constraint and then you will have a shape. So the formulation, of the problem is the following. You have to build a picnic area and it is to be rectangular with an area of 5,000 square yards. So first of all, this is the constraint because the area is fixed. and is to be fenced off on three sides. Um, the fourth side is not fenced as it is adjacent to a highway. And you want to basically see what is the relative uh, size of this squared shape so that you have the least amount of fence. And what is the least amount of fence needed for this? So a picture will be pretty clarifying. Here you have the highway. Here you have the figure, which is a rectangle, not necessarily a square. This is X and Y, and the picnic area is fixed. And the fence will be made of this side plus these two sides. This one is not fenced, so we don't take it in account. So if you compute basically the length of the fence constructed, it's a function of these two variables, which is X plus two Y. So this is just a highway. If you want to see why we don't take in uh, account this side. And the goal, is to minimize f subject to the constraint g of x, y, which is the area, which is x times y, because you have a rectangle, and this is 5,000, okay? So, I spent a little bit of time in writing this, but is the formulation clear? Okay, fixed area, Minimize this subject to this constraint. Okay, so we could compute the partials, of course. Fx is equal to 1, Fy is equal to 2, um, G of x is equal to y, Gy is equal to x, if you look at the shapes. And, well, then you would have Lagrange equations 
where you have OK1, which is equal to fx, which should be equal to lambda gx, which is lambda y. Then you have 2, which is equal to fy, which is equal to lambda gy, so lambda x. And then you have the constraint, which is basically xy, which is the function g of x and y, which is equal to 5,000. Okay? So, so far, in terms of reformulation, everybody's with me at this point? Yeah. Okay. So, criteria of this partial derivative of capital F equal to zero, which is why this is representing, and then the constraint. So, well, yeah, we can pretty much solve the system of equations right now. Um, so what you would have is one over y is equal to lambda, and then two over x is equal to lambda. This should be equal to this. So you have one over y equal to two over x. So you could have x is equal to two y. Um, then you could also plug in this back here because this is equal to x y. So you have two y times y because this is x y. So two y squared. So you would have y squared, okay, y. and well, so this is the square root of y, which is 2,500, which if you take the square root, and of course you're going to take the positive value, so basically you have 50, 50, 50 gives you this, and then you have that x is equal to 2y, so you have 100. Um, so you try to simplify your life. And at this point, you kind of like didn't take into account the lambda because at least for the moment, you don't care about it. Um, of course, this constraint uh, maximum would be the point 150. And if you look, what is the product xy? Well, you get the constraint. So you're actually satisfying the constraint and doing the optimization. And then if you want to evaluate the function, of course, okay, x, y equal to x plus 2y, which is equal to 100, plus 250, so you have 200, and the units were yards, okay? Uh, of course, the number is important. Most importantly, I think the procedure is what is important because it's the first time that you're doing this problem, right? So first of all, realize what is the equation for your constraint fixed area, then formulate what you want to optimize, which is in this case the perimeter of what you're building. This is not taken in account because you will not have any sensor. So you have x plus 2y. Then, in order to find the maximum of these with the constraint of the fixed area x, y equal to 5,000, you have to do the Lagrange's equations, which are basically fx equal to lambda gx, fy or lambda gy, constraint, which you know. You can play with these two to basically get a relation between x and y, then plug it in back in the constraint to find one of the variables, which is uh, y in this case, go back to this relation to find x, then evaluate the function so that you see what is basically the maximum value in this case. And of course, if you want a sanity check or a double check to see if you have found, well, if you didn't make any mistake in the calculation, because of course, if everything is solved correctly, you have to satisfy the constraint. So this would be a sanity check in the sense that if you're not satisfying the constraint, you did something wrong, okay? But that is the method. So try to remember step by step. Okay, so I hope you find it interesting. I'm pretty sure it is the first time that you have seen this. So we will do a new exercise, which is 5.2, which is to find the maximum and the minimum values if the function is xy, the product, subject to the constraint x squared plus y squared is equal to x. Okay? This is mathematical I mean, for its own sake. At the same time, you notice that there are some symmetries, basically, if you change the role of x and y, it doesn't make any difference. This is symmetric if you flip x and y. So you might expect that for the solutions that you get. Um, so again, the solution, right? Well, first of all, 
we already know what is the constraint, g of x, y, is actually this function. So this is just to find g. Now, um, for these Lagrange's equations, we need to find the partial, so that is what we're gonna do. So if x is equal to y, if y is equal to x, as you can see, then by this, gx is equal to 2x, gy is equal to 2y, the Lagrange's equations, um, again, it's learned by doing, so uh, basically by posing the problem, writing, doing the algebra, you will eventually learn what are the equations and what is what you have to do. So, well, the first one is, if you remember, so we have y equal to fx, which is equal to lambda gx, which is equal to 2x lambda. The second one, the Lagrange equation is if y equal to lambda gy, so if y was equal to x, lambda gy is equal to 2y lambda. I can again basically pass things to the other side to get rid of lambda. So what you have is that y divided by 2x is equal to lambda. In this case, x divided by 2y is equal to lambda. Um, well, there is an observation which actually is pretty good to have as a sign to check. You know that the sum of x squared and y squared should be 8, which means that, I mean, first of all, you cannot have 0 for this value, for both of them. If they both were 0, you wouldn't have the 8. So one of them, at least, should be non-zero, right, for not speaking. Um, then you have this relation. Um, well, yeah, unless you have like a very uh, singular case where lambda is equal to zero, you kind of like, kind of see that you would have uh, some non-zero values. But let me do the algebra and then I will finish. So essentially what I have is y over two x equal to x over two y. So I could pass, well, basically y over x equal to x over y. So I have y over x squared equal to one. Uh, I can add that to the constraint also over here because remember that my constraint was equal to x squared plus y squared. Um, yeah, well, basically what I would have here is 2y squared because this means that y squared is equal to x squared, okay, you see? I pass this, okay, equal to one, the squares must be equal, then I plug in y squared equal to x squared, so that means that y squared is equal to four by making the division, which means that y is equal to plus minus two, then y squared is equal to x squared, that means that x is equal to plus minus two, so you observe the symmetry that I had mentioned before, where there is symmetry between the equations of g and the equations of uh, x, y. So actually, I mean, you know that you have basically these points, two comma two, minus two comma two, um, two minus two, minus two minus two, okay? Because these are the possible values. So you're basically doing by combinatorics the possible combinations of plus minus two. Which two times two is equal to four. Um, yeah, so, well, if you actually monitor what is the product, x, y, which is what you want to optimize, subject to this constraint, this is the constraint, this is what you want to maximize. So at least you have to optimize, or meaning like basically evaluating the values, right? So this is two times two, which is four. These are of different signs, so f of minus two comma two is equal to minus four. f of two minus two is equal to minus four. And f, sorry, I wrote uh, something. I missed a minus here, sorry about that. So f of minus two minus two, let me write it here. f of minus two minus two, which is equal to minus two squared is equal to four. So what you can see is, so you have four possible points, two comma two minus two, two, two minus two, minus two minus two. And the maximum value is four, for which you have two points that satisfy, two comma two and minus two minus two, where they are from the same sign and the points which have opposite sign, minus two comma two or two minus two have the minimum value which is minus four, okay? So, and I mean, of course, both of them satisfy the constraint. The square of both of these points or is basically x squared is equal to four, so four plus four equal to eight, 
all of them satisfy the constraint. And so this would be basically the maximum value. I'm going to write something to summarize it. Um, so when x squared plus y squared is equal to 8, the maximum value of the function f is 4, which is f of 2 comma 2, and f of minus 2 minus 2. Remember that f of x and y was x times y. So of course, even if these are negative, if they have the same sign, they give you the 4 again. Now, the minimum value is minus 4, which would be f of, when you have different signs, so minus 2, 2, or 2 minus 2, okay? So, and all of them satisfy the constraint, 2 times 4, 8. So again, there is a procedure if you want to study how to solve it. Identify the function to be optimized, identify the constraint, find uh, Lagrange's equations, fx lambda dx, fy equal to lambda dy, constraint, find the relation between x and y, perhaps getting rid of lambda, plugging it back in the constraint to find a condition for y, which is what we did, then find the x from the previous relation, evaluate the points to find out which are the maximum or minimum points, and yeah, basically evaluating all these possible critical points, and we verify that they satisfy the constraint. So the formula or the formulation is again this same problem. Um, is there any question? Is the methodology clear of how we went? Okay, that's good. Uh, all right, so. Okay, we have one last example, which is more applied, so hopefully we'll find it more interesting. So what you're gonna do now is to maximize the utility. And so what you have, as we have seen before, is a utility function named u of x and y that measures the total satisfaction, or we are going to call it utility, that a consumer receives from having x units of one commodity and y units of another one. The practical example, which is 7.5.3, is the following. You have $600 to spend on two commodities. The first one costs $20 per unit, and the second one costs $13 per unit. Now, we'll assume again these functions that we saw before, the cost of us. So the utility is given by a Cobb-Douglas function. Of the form u of x y equal to 10 times x to the point 6, y to the point 4. If you remember, the power should give you 1 when added, which is the case in this uh, example. So the question is, how many units of each one of the commodity should we buy to maximize the utility. So, I mean, disregarding the new terms, etc., etc., it's clear. The function u is the one that you should optimize. The constraint is the budget. So you have to formulate the budget, and once you have given the equation for the constraint, you will do the procedure as usual, right? So the goal is to maximize 
the function u of x, y subject to the budget constraint which is given by the function g of x, y equal to 20x plus 30y and equal to 600. So this is the total budget that you have. You cannot spend more. Then this is the price for each unit and you have x units for the first one. Then this is the price for the second unit and this is the amount of units you have for the second one. So again, the same computation that you do when you go to Walmart and you evaluate how much you spend on each uh, different thing. Let's say you buy only two products, this is pretty much it. And you cannot spend more. Of course, you're assuming that if you spend more, you will get better results. But okay, this is basically the constraint which is fixed. Um, well, now we're clear. This is the function. This is the constraint. We have to do Lagrange's equation. So, well, I mean, you could say that you have to compute the partials. So you know that ux is equal to lambda dx, uy is equal to lambda dy. The third one is the constraint. If you do the computation, well, you see that basically for this one, you have the 0.6 coming down, multiplied by 10. So this would be 6 when you do the multiplication. And then x to minus 0.4 times y to the 0.4. Then uy, you have 0.4 multiplied by 10, so you have 4. Then you have x to the same power. And then y to minus 0.6. Um, so then you have to evaluate this, right? So lambda g of x, so this is 20 lambda, this is 30 lambda, noticing the dependence. Um, what else? Yeah, well, you can actually write this in a nice shape. So this is 6 times y divided by x, the 0.4. This is 4 times x divided by y to the 0.6. So well, we could do the same procedure as we did before, which is basically that lambda is equal to 6 over 20, y over x to the 0.4. This would mean that lambda is equal to 4 over 30 of x over y to the 0.6. Uh, then you would equate these two, so you can pass things to the other side, etc., etc. But for example, what you could get is that basically 30 times 6, um, divided by 20 times 4. So this would be equal, and you're passing to the other side, so you have x over y, right? So I'm playing with the exponents. I'm passing this to the other side, add it, they give me 1, and you have x over y. And then I'm passing this stuff to the other side. Um, so, well, OK, so we have 3 times 6 and 2 times 4. Um, yeah, so we have, yeah, basically this is again 2 half squared. So you have 2 over 2 squared. Um, so 9 over 4 if you want. And then you would have that x is equal to 9 over 4 times y. Um, so now what you can do, again, the third Lagrange's equation is the constraint, which is that 600 is equal to 20x plus 30y. Now. If you use this, what you have is 20, then 9 over 4 times y plus 30y. So this would be 5 times 9 plus 30y. So uh, let's see. Yeah, so you have 45 plus 30 times y. So you have 75y. If you do the division, then you have that y is equal to 600 divided by 75, which would be equal to 8. And then you have x, which is equal to 9 divided by 4 times y. So you have 9 times 2, which is 18. So that would mean that the point is x comma y equal to 18 times 8. And perhaps we need one next step. Let me see. Um, well, look, it's clear that, of course, depending on the nature of the function that you have to optimize, essentially you're at the mercy of your own algebra, right? So if the equation is easy to do, fair enough. If not, you have to find ingenious ways to do it. Hopefully the fact that we know that the sum of the exponents is 1 makes this pretty straightforward. 
And the last thing is basically to just make a curve that it's important for this. So if you remember, this was called the indifference curve, uh, the level set. So I must say that if you really care that much about the hardest topic in the course, that's the way you're going to get the result. So best of luck if you want to leave two minutes before the exam. So indifference curves are the level curves of the utility function. And you have a constraint, which is 600 equal to 20x plus 30y. And what you have is that this level curve is basically u of x, y equal to the value evaluated at this point, which is 18, 8. And I mean, you probably know this, actually, I won't spend too much time because clearly you're not care too much about it. But 